everyone, and welcome to another Zoom edition of City Talk as we're still dealing with the pandemic, as well as uh, many other crises that I probably don't have to brief you on. I'm uh, recording this live from, well, not live, but live on tape, as they say, uh, from the City County Building. Due to technical difficulties beyond my control, I couldn't do it out of my home. And believe me, most technical difficulties are beyond my control. Here is the lovely and talented Sally Stadelman, the Chief of Staff for newly elected Councilman Bobby Wilson. And she is indeed live from her home lair. Uh, Sally, welcome to the program. Hi, John. How are you? I'm good. And yourself? I'm doing pretty good. Hanging in there. So you just uh, come into council, but you do have a background in uh, government. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I'm actually in uh, uh, year six of working for the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, I started out in the Office of Community Affairs in uh, uh, Mayor Bill Peduto's office. Uh, from there, I moved to uh, work with the Chief Operations Officer, Guy Costa. Uh, I then managed an app for people experiencing homelessness and anybody in need called BigBird.com, uh, which is still available, still a great service. Uh, from there, I then went on to uh, work for the Department of Permits, Licenses, and Inspections as their Government and Community Affairs Liaison, uh, and then was lucky enough to start as uh, Councilman Bobby Wilson's Chief of Staff this January. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, you had more people telling you what to do before, but now you'll be one of the people telling other people what to do. I, I, is it more responsibility is all I'm trying to ask? Um, I, I still have just as many people telling me what to do because I work for the citizens of the city of Pittsburgh and, uh, you know, just as pretty much all my other positions, they're calling every day looking for help and looking for services. Uh, and I'm on the other end uh, trying to do that. So, and what are they calling about uh, these days? Are there different kinds of calls because of what we're all experiencing? Yeah, so yeah, the pandemic has really uh, affected the office in some interesting ways. Um, I just was talking to um, a woman this morning who usually gets her taxes done by VITA, the free tax service program. And most places have actually suspended uh, their uh, in-person tax help. Uh, and so you know, we're now looking for some kind of option for her uh, so that she can get her taxes done for free. And she's, you know, she's intimidated by the online, uh, the online form doing that herself. So uh, kind of things you just wouldn't expect that, that, uh, that pop up and cause problems. And of course, lots of connections to service, social services, making sure people know about where to get free food and supplies. Um, our office actually did a, a pretty big uh, fundraiser to get some of our senior high rises essential supplies. Uh, awesome. So are you getting a higher volume of calls uh, these days as opposed to when things were so-called more normal? Um, you know, it's, it's probably been about the same. It, it's hard to say for sure because, you know, we're only, we're almost six months into being in, uh, in, in office. So it, 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 hasn't, it hasn't fluctuated too greatly. Uh, tell us where you're from originally. Uh, I grew up in a little town called Washington, Pennsylvania, about 40 minutes outside of the city. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's not too far. You can see there's uh, the Lemoyne House uh, and the Bradford House where the Whiskey Rebellion began in, in little Washington. Well, that's some interesting history. And then how did you end up, uh, where did you go to school? Uh, I came to Pittsburgh to go to Pitt. And I have to credit all my success to my uh, two professors, Nello Giorgetti and Dennis McManus. Um, they have a class called the Institute of Politics. And I was placed in the office of Councilman Bill Peduto as an intern um, in the fall of 2012. So it was, he was just getting ready to run for mayor uh, right at the end of my internship. So it, it all kind of started there. And did you have an interest in government uh, prior to taking that class and then and getting the internship uh, with the now mayor? You know, John, I did. Uh, but the interesting thing was that I thought I was going to be working in international politics. Uh, I had done an internship at, uh, in Brussels with the European Parliament over the summer and was translating letters from English to Spanish, Spanish to English to condemn human rights violations in South America. And, you know, I don't think I ever would have guessed that I was going to, you know, stay in my, my, my hometown doing, uh, working for municipal government. Uh, interesting. Is it, is it um, but I bet it's really hands-on. I mean, you're helping individuals 
on a one-to-one -one basis each and every day. Yeah, yes. It's, there is something so satisfying about being involved at the local level, you know, knowing everybody that you're working with, the folks that you're helping, you know, there's one degree of separation between uh, most of the, you know, constituents and folks I work with at the city. And it really, you know, I talk to friends sometimes that will talk about how overwhelmed they feel about all the terrible things that, that are happening in the world today. And there's, there's something so nice about working in local government where you really feel like as, as big as some of the challenges are that we're facing, it still feels like you can get your arms around it um, in a way that when I think about how do we solve you know, global issues, feels a lot more overwhelming. So I, I am really grateful for that, that, uh, that hands-on aspect. So you say get stuff done. What, what would you and the councilman, uh, we talked to him as you know in a previous episode, like to get done on the north side? Well, where do we start? Um, <laughs> you know, I'll say coming from PLI, um, and you know, and I think generally- uh, Permits, city, licenses, and inspections, permits, right? Like, exactly. Okay. Um, you know, I am really passionate about um, vacant and blighted property and you know, what we're going to do to address vacant lots and vacant and abandoned homes and the effects that they have on our neighborhoods. Um, we really, you know, due to a myriad of reasons, don't have strong uh, land recycling tools. And of course, when you're talking about land recycling, you have to be really hyper aware of the effects they have on the neighborhood and making sure that you're protecting affordability as you go about solving those issues. Um, so I think, you know, I will feel like I've, I've accomplished something if we're able to move the needle in any way or be helpful in any way uh, to make a change in, in that arena. That really is a challenge, isn't it? Maintaining affordability as you improve neighborhoods. And I don't think anyone on earth has figured out how to solve that yet. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I, I think, you know, no model is perfect, but I do think we have some, some good examples in the city. Uh, I think any time that you're able to first preserve affordable rental housing, um, so you could look at Manchester, um, even in the war streets to, to, to a bit of an extent, we, we have a little bit of that where there's been stabilization of the rental market before the, uh, the, the real estate market took off. And so those units are protected um, and, they're, and they're not subject to the, the high market rate. Um, but we definitely have a lot of work to do. Uh, and you have a lot of books to read. I noticed that there are many, many books online. <laughs> Are you an yeah. avid reader? <laughs> you know, I can't take credit for all of them. Uh, my partner is is uh, probably is is the can claim ownership to most of them. Um, but yeah, he's he's quite the collector. I think I've got a couple of shelves on there that that I can claim as my own. So, do you find since you've been working in government all this time that the stereotype of uh, you know the lazy bureaucrat is hopefully uh, not uh, true, generally speaking? <sighs> well, uh, so. Actually, when I was in the Office of Community Affairs, I ran a program called the Civic Leadership Academy. And one of my favorite parts about that program is that it totally decimated that, that stereotype. Because folks could come in, uh, take this free 10-week class, and they got to meet the directors and workers in these departments, and they got to see how much work really went into making these city departments run. Uh, I think people generally, their, their hair was blown back to really, when they came to learn and understand the breadth and width of, of city government and all that we do. Uh, so, you know, and those, uh, hopefully that program continues, but uh, if, you know, anybody's interested, they, applications usually start in, uh, in late fall or uh, late summer. Uh, one thing I find interesting is people like yourself have a really, you have a lot of enthusiasm about your job. I mean, you really like uh, being in public service and uh, maybe that's not as rare as it should be, or maybe that's, less rare than I think it is. But anyway, you seem to really enjoy your work. Yeah, yes. Uh, I am, you know, I'm definitely a nerd about <laughs> municipal government and, uh, you know, enjoy reading, uh, you know, catching up on, on muni code. And it's, and it's really one of the, the most exciting aspects of, of this new position that I'm taking on is, is really getting to understand in a lot more detail how the legislative process works. You would recommend a career in government service uh, to any of the humans who might be considering such things who might be watching this? Well, I mean, it's, it's definitely not for everybody. Um, you know, I, I think that we have uh, lots of, of constituents that, um, 
you know, I, I am always, I am always honored that I get to pick up the phone and, and be able to offer help to the person at the other end. Uh, but sometimes, you know, working with folks that like to, to care loudly um, isn't for everybody. Uh, and, you know, when you're working in a big, uh, you know, big bureaucracy, sometimes things move kind of slow and it takes a lot of time to build consensus and to do the right kind of, of community outreach you need to, to build that consensus to get the community to support changes that you'd like to make. Um, you know, it's, so that's, it's not for everybody. Um, I think I, I think I might be up to about 2000 emails right now from starting from mid last week from residents reaching out, uh, wanting to share uh, feedback on, um, on, on a lot of them are, are calling to, to ask for the, us to defund the police department. Um, and so that's, that's another great example of a really, really important conversation um, that, you know, you need patience and you have to have, you know, an open mind and an, an open heart uh, and be ready to have tough conversations and, and um, think quickly. Yeah. On so and I, um, I not know. to get off into an endless discussion, but that could mean, at least from what I've heard so far, and as we record this, we're just starting the conversation, shifting resources elsewhere as opposed to just removing all funds just right. for clarification right yeah. yes and i'm yeah i mean that's that is definitely um you know above i mean it is above my pay grade at at this very moment i understand you know, it's I'm, certainly above mine I'm as well collecting yes the info and getting it to 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 my boss um, right to help make informed decisions so yeah we're but you know we are definitely we are looking at some very serious and very important community conversations ahead of us no question um and finally, how we're into the green phase now as this is being recorded, so things are a little more loosey goosey. But how are you holding up under um, still somewhat uh, isolated circumstances? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I think that that we are very fortunate that we're a small office. We're just it's the councilman and, and two staffers right now. So uh, I think unlike some of our other departments, it, it was pretty easy for us to just kind of pick up shop and and not miss a beat and and, and keep working from home. So we're just trying to figure out you know, what that looks like going forward. You know, are we, are we still at home for the summer? Are we gonna come in sometimes? Um, are we gonna keep doing our late night staff meetings and work all day or? Uh, so yeah, so it, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of a, you know, one day at a time right now. Uh, excellent uh, point on which to conclude. Sally Stadelman, live from the home office. Thank you so much for uh, doing the Zoom edition of City Talk. Thanks, John, appreciate it. When we come back, you'll meet somebody who has to make sure all the computers uh, for the various departments in the city work, and if they don't fix them, uh, stay with us. City Talk, another Zoom edition during the global pandemic, and say hello from the Department of Innovation and Performance to Dana Robinson. Dana, welcome to the program. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. So you run the team that is responsible for all of the city's computers, the fixing them, getting the new ones to people, getting the old ones out of people's hands once they become obsolete. Is that a fair uh, general description? Yeah, that's, that's a fair assessment. Yeah, my, my team is... Uh, at the service desk, uh, what used to be the help desk, 
mm-hmm. uh, part of tier one and part of our, our tier two teams. So we kind of took, you know, parts from each one of those teams and just morphed it into one big you know, super team like Voltron. So that's a huge responsibility. But before I ask you about it, this is how good your yeah. team is. There's this knucklehead who hosts the program called City Talk, and he tried to do it from his house today, but he doesn't even know his own Wi-Fi password. So he scrambled into the building and uh, got to members of your team who quickly hooked him up with this uh, fine setup at the last minute, even though they were already working on many other projects. That's, That's awesome. That's how good your team is. We, we, we aim to please. We're here to serve. But uh, go more into detail about what on earth, uh, what everything uh, is that you do um, uh, with the computers and how you're serving thousands of employees, correct? Correct. So, so I, an overall view, I guess, um, we, we do, uh, triage for any type of computer related issues. Um, we also, we field calls, people call in, they have something wrong with their computer. Uh, they might need, uh, equipment order, things like that. We pretty much cover all of that stuff. Uh, and sometimes I'm guessing you're just overwhelmed with uh, requests. Yes. Sometimes, sometimes it gets hectic. You, we do have those pockets of, uh, of quietness. I'm not going to say boredom, but, you know, um, there are days that when it's, it's more quiet than others. Uh, usually the beginning of the week is usually when it's the busiest. By the end of the week, we kind of, uh, it kind of mellows out. But, yeah, we, uh, sometimes we get overwhelmed, um, especially with um, tickets. We had a lot of tickets that come in. And to translate for people who don't know, a ticket is just the request, please get me a new computer or please fix my old computer or please give me advice on how to do something that I don't know how to do. Yes, that's it. Yeah. It's, what we call, um, so if a problem comes in when there's an issue with your computer, uh, we call that an incident. If it's just a request for services, we, we call that a request. Um, so what we do, um, what our department has recently done is everybody in our department has become ITIL certified. Um, for those that don't know what that is, that's a framework um, of best practices for you know, information technology, for you know, people that are in the IT field to better manage, control, and understand you know, not only computer problems that, that people have, but also dealing with them you know, from the best service possible. So. Right, and I know the ITIL uh, is all training that all of us received in our Department of Innovation and Performance has yes. a lot to do with process improvement. What are you doing yes. now? How can you do it better and more efficient? Exactly. Uh, so tell us uh, your background. Where are you from originally? Um, originally from the north side of Pittsburgh. Um, I'm a hometown guy, born and raised here. I, uh, I, left, for, I left for a little bit. I, I moved to New York. Um, me and my, my brother and my sister started a business start our own company. I have a few brothers and sisters, by the way, but yeah, we, uh, we went up there and started a clothing business and that was, uh, you know, we've we seen some success with that, but then I, um, I don't know. I, I've always had a, a itch for computers. How and did you develop an interest uh, for that? At what age did you start uh, becoming interested in computers? I uh, believe it or not, I was nine years old. Huh? Yeah. My grandfather, um, he was, he was in the military and he got me involved with, with computers, they used to have these groups at uh, over at CCAC, um, like computer groups. They would meet like once a month, and they discuss, you know, like the new trends and the new things coming out. And at that time, when I was nine, people didn't really have personal computers at home, so it was like I, I was kind of at the at the at the beginning of that, like the onset of like personal computers being in the home. So, yeah, I've been around it that long, kind of aging thing myself. I- one thing I know that uh, some people uh, who I've met who've been into computers over the years and making a living at it as you do, is that you constantly have to keep updated because they're constantly changing. There are new things to learn all the time, correct? Correct. Yeah, correct. I'm, you know, I'm 45 and I'm, you know, I'm still in class. I'm still taking classes. I'm still in school, you know, learning um, outside of that. I try to pick up, you know, books or, you know, go online and look and see what new trends are coming out. It's, it's very important in this field to stay on top of what's going on, paying and attention you, to. Right, right. But do you continue to be fascinated by it or is it like, oh no, this happened. Now I have to learn all this stuff. Oh no, it's, it's still, I'm, I'm still like a little kid for me. 
uh, you know what I mean? Just seeing the new things that come out. I get excited when I, you know, I hear about technology and, and new technologies that are coming out. And I like to follow the trends too, because sometimes, you know, when you're in it this long, sometimes you can kind of tell if something's going to go, if it's going to, you know, go the distance or not. Sometimes you get surprised, but majority of the time when, when something new comes out of new technology, you can kind of tell if it's, it's going to be here for the long run. So did you also attend school uh, for this or just uh, fall into a city job involving computers and continue to teach yourself? Uh, it's it actually a little bit of both. I, um, I started working for the city first. That's back when our department, IMP, used to be called CIS, which is City Information Systems. So I started in the mailroom. Um, I used to deliver these, these old, these big reports, like, like big binder full of uh, reports. And they used to be on old dot matrix printers, very cumbersome, very heavy. Um, but then as, as the technology advanced, um, I had a chance to you know, get promoted, right? So there was a, a big project. This is when the city um, started getting out of those, the old uh, CRV, um, I mean, C, I'm sorry, CRT uh, monitors. Like it was just um, like we used to call it dumb box, right? And it didn't really do much. It just did like basic computing and they were moving it to the, these compact desktops with monitors. So the whole entire city switched to that. And I was a part of that process in installing those devices. And out of that, um, I got my shot, so to speak. And I never looked back. When you started in the mailroom, did you expect that you'd be uh, one day running the team that fixes computers? No, that wasn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Um, at that time, I can't. I, honestly, I can't say that I that I saw this, you know, but um it's a good feeling. It's, it, it almost feels like I came full circle. So, No, that's actually quite a success story. That's an awesome story. Um, Thank you. You would encourage other people to um, engage in a career in uh, city government? Definitely, I would. Um, if I will say this. If, if you're a person that likes, that likes to, to give, if you're a person that believes in civil servitude, um, taking the job in, in whether it's local, state, you know, federal, if you enjoy that type of work and like seeing what you do as, as a profession, help the people of the city um, get things done and help other, you know, co-workers and other departments in the city to uh, to see things get accomplished, I would definitely, I would recommend it. Um, it's just, so, it's, it's, a, it's a good job. And, you know, a lot of city workers, we get a, a bad rap of being lazy or, or, or not, you know, doing you know, work that's befitting of the taxpayer dollar, but I'd have to disagree with that that notion. How have you been holding up uh, holding up during the pandemic? I know um, you've got a few people still working here, a few people working uh, from home. Yes. So um, we've been doing pretty good. Um, I'll say first and foremost, nobody on my team has uh, has been sick or been diagnosed. So that's you know that's a great thing. That's a blessing in itself. Um, so we were, we were in the, in the office every day, I say for about the first month from, from March, I think March 9th to maybe right. the first week, first, second week in April. And, uh, during that time we were provisioning machines for all the users. I'm not gonna say all the users, but you know, the majority of users that are working from home, uh, we were provisioning machines for them to make sure that they can work from home. So but that how was, was that, that though? Because you, you were um, you figured out how to work from home after a few weeks, but you guys were some of the few people in the building. Yes, and one of the few teams required to be here, uh, at least at the beginning. Was that sort of a bizarre circumstance? Uh, to be honest, I, it wasn't. Okay. I think we we were so we were so entrenched and determined to make sure that we got the equipment out to the users and that they could work. And that, you know, they were functional at home. I think we, we more or less focused on that. And I believe that it, it made our team stronger. Our camaraderie got, it got better. Um, you know, the way that we work with each other improved. And then, um, you know, it was, it actually turned out to be a good thing, you know. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, so what can we look forward to, uh, in your opinion, in the years to come in terms of computers just, doing even crazier things that we can't even imagine them doing now? 
Uh, so I know, so if, if we're talking from a technology perspective, like, so you have, you know, autonomous cars now, um, you know, self-driving cars. Mm-hmm. I, I think um, you're going to see more the evolution of AI, artificial intelligence, um, the, the use of automation in everyday computing. Um, a lot of things in the beginning, you know what I'm saying, were manual, but you're starting to see that progression change from, you know, putting in a commands request to just writing a script and making it run automatically. I think we're going to get to a point where you're going to be able to do that just by a gesture um, or a thought. You know, it's it's getting to be that intricate, especially with um, AI. I so think the computer might be able that. to the computer might be able to read your thoughts. Yeah, uh, you never know. I think they're doing <laughs> that already. I know there are there are some you know machines like like bio machines that can you know they 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 read your you know your temperature or your heart rate. They can tell what kind of mood you're in and different things like that. It's kind of crazy, but yeah, I think um, just for the average person, I think. Uh, you're going to see a lot more automation in your home, like your, you know, your TVs, your, your appliances, your cars, your lights, and, you know, and a lot of that stuff is already in the market, but uh, I think it's going to become a standard maybe within the next five or 10 years. And in the end, will the robots re- rebel and we'll all be working for them? That's a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Uh, please, you know, I, I hope not, but, uh, now I think, but you're always gonna you're always gonna have the need for human interaction. You know, even with you know uh, artificial intelligence, the ability to feel, the ability, the, the ability to be able to comprehend, to be able to make a decision, not based on statistics, but on just you know intuition. I guess is the word. Um, you're always going to have a place for human interaction in life. No right, so you don't see the maybe. development of Stepford Wives like in a movie or anything like that? No, I don't see that. Or husbands, for that matter. You know, yeah. No, I don't, I don't right. think so. I don't think, I don't think it'll get that far. Glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dana Robinson, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us on this Zoom edition of City Talk. Oh, thanks, John. It's been a pleasure. All right, we'll see you uh, some, sooner or later. We'll see you live and in person. Yes, sir. Uh, Dana Robinson, ladies and gentlemen, that's City Talk for this edition. Uh, have a great day.